Okay. All right, guys, uh, welcome to the sixth annual Mid-Atlantic event. It's great to have you all here again. We had this thing about people sitting too spread out in the big rooms we used to have, so we fixed that problem this year. <laughs> we wanted it to be real intimate. Um, we figured you'd get a better look at the products, the presentations, and each other. So, what do you think? Did it work? Can you all breathe? <laughs> Um, our first speaker is Everett Abrams. He is the premier wood expert in the power washing industry. I mean, he knows so much about wood. I, I, I literally don't think there's anybody else that knows more. How can I say that a third time the same way but different? <laughs> Sounds good. Anyway, Everett Abrams. <laughs> Okay, morning everybody. Morning. It's always fun being the first person to talk while everybody's still sleeping and <laughs> drinking their coffee and whatnot. You see we already lost Colin already. He's probably out at the is the bar open yet? I think Colin might have a shot. <laughs> if y'all join the take five on the <laughs> Yeah, he's icing the bar now and helping. Um, anyway, uh, what I was asked to do this, I, you don't know the audience, so you don't know if there's going to be people who have been around for a while, new people and so forth. So what I'm doing is uh, we're going to talk about uh, some of the basics with wood, but we're going to go over some of the stuff and how it relates to some of the new stuff too that, that's out and some of the things people are challenged with um, regarding wood. So as we go through this, um, I'd like it to be interactive. So if anybody has any questions or wants to raise their hand about something, please do that. Um, we talk about stripping. If somebody wants to talk about some of the solid base strippers and some of the products that are out there that people are having difficulty with, please do that. And then we'll talk about what is uh, relatively uh, the standard in the industry as well. So uh, they're the kind of things we'll talk about. And then, uh, like I said, just be as interactive as you want. Raise your hand, speak out. We're fine. It's a nice intimate group. Um, like, very nice job of Bill to get this room for us. That was nice. Okay. How many people in here, just by raising hands, do decks and wood? How many are part time at it? How many do it full time? <laughs> part time first. <laughs> We're supposed to raise both hands. Part time and full time? So almost everybody's doing a lot of full time. Okay. Raise both hands. Now I'm good. Try to see if you can move it. The reason we're doing the reason we're doing we're doing uh, I like walking around. It's tough to get used to that. Um, anyway, the reason we're doing this is to be uh, profitable. So one of the challenges most people run into is, and they, the reason they get out of it is, they're not profitable doing wood. The idea is to be profitable. There's a lot of things that go into cost. Um, what we're doing decks, homes, wood siding, anything wood. Um, one of the things I learned from Ron Musgraves a long time ago. Um, one of our first conversations we had many, many years ago was how to figure out your expenses in a job. And I would just say that most people, when they get into the wood, they're thinking of the stripper, the time, cost, and so forth and so on. But the other things you have to really take into account is where you're going to make your money. And they're the, they're the pitfalls. So what happened was Ron told me, take a stopwatch, and when you start a job from a phone call, start to take, counting your time and everything that goes into that job, and you can figure out how much time you're really putting into the job and what's going into that job. So I started figuring out a lot of stuff that was going wrong with me right off of the bat. I wasn't figuring the time into it that I really thought I should. I might have been standing for, for two hours and thinking, wow, I'm only doing this for an hour. I'm only adding an hour's worth of time and so forth. So um, the idea is to be profitable. Um, and hopefully what we talk about will get you there. Um, so this is a module that we start with uh, when I'm teaching the class. And one of the first things we talk about is the standard um, that most people should be using. This is what the Forest Products Lab is trying to get to. They've had their budget severely cut, but this is what they want in standard. First is to pre-wet all surfaces. 
anybody applying chemicals to dry wood? Roof cleaning, anybody? Everybody's pre-wetting? Okay. The idea with pre-wetting, and uh, I'll get into this because we had a conversation uh, last night. We were talking about some of this, and it comes up in a lot of these, uh, uh, these settings, is water is a barrier as well. Water can help you with wood restoration. Where's most of the mold and mildew on the wood? It's on the top. It's on the surface. A lot of the guys doing soft washing and so forth, they're just cleaning the wood. They're walking up and they're throwing their solutions on dry wood. If you're doing that with things like cedar roofs and cedar shakes, it's so porous that it's just sucking it right in. So then it goes past the mold and mildew, it's not as effective. When you pre-wet, you're actually filling the cells of the wood, you're creating that barrier. So now when you apply your, your whatever chemicals, whether it's a cleaner or a stripper or whatever, it's up on the surface where it should be working. And you'll get a much better result, be much more effective. So the idea of pre-wetting should be anytime you're using chemicals, you're going to pre-wet. And then pre-wetting helps, helps your, uh, your result. Um, applying chemicals, cleaners, strippers, brighteners, that's part of your uh, uh, standard. Uh, in other words, no, just water. So we're always either cleaning or we're stripping uh, and brightening. Whenever we apply chemicals, it's rinse, rinse, and rinse again. Um, that gets into a little bit of a debate. Um, I've had uh, chemists that have told me that if you use a brightener and you neutralize um, your stripper, that you're good to go. You don't have to rinse. One of the things that the Forest Products Lab is saying is anytime you use a chemical, even if it's a brightener, and you have neutralized the surface, you should still rinse. Okay. Um, and then a fourth is you should apply a preservative, whether a seal or a stain, a coating, something um, to the wood surfaces. <laughs> Okay, um, I kept this in there because of the types of wood. Um, some of the ones that are coming out there are uh, <coughs> a lot of different hardwoods and exotics that people are using. And the reason they're doing that is because they don't want to pay the cost of the composites. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are seeing that, your demographic areas and so forth. I'm in New Jersey. The Jersey Shore is still a lot of composites, but when you go <coughs> inland, people are, especially on their, their main homes, they're using a lot of exotic wood. California, a lot of exotic wood. So you run into start seeing stuff like large bamboo and some of the other ones that are out there. Um, anybody have a story or something with an exotic <coughs> wood deck they've done? Anybody? Everybody, anybody done eBay? A lot of it or just a few? A lot? Yeah, I know about 15 to 20 yeah. every year. I get people that run away from it all, all the time. It's like a lot of contractors don't want to do it. It's it's not that hard to do. It really isn't. So, so would you run through the process of EPEG? I have uh, I've seen it, have never worked on it. On the EPEG? Yeah. The EPEG, the best thing to do is uh, I always forewarn a customer because they usually let it gray out. It's not going to, it's going to be different than most wood. So when you put a coating on, you're probably getting a year. The most you're probably going to get is 18 months on it. Um, and that's not even going to be the initial time. Also, they've seen it gray. Some of the characteristics of Ipe are a little different than other wood. Uh, Ipe can have a green, orange, different flecks in the wood that you won't see when it's gray, but when you clean it, you do. So then when you clean it, you brighten it, it looks beautiful, you, see, you put a sealer on it, then the people see these flecks and they're like, well, what is that? Is it something in the sealer? Is it something you did? So you forewarn them, it's a natural characteristic. It usually comes out and enhanced with a sealer. Um, the other thing too with Ipe is, uh, in a lot of the hardwoods, there's three shades to the wood. You have a light, a medium, and a dark. And what happens is they may not remember, they just see it gray again. They may not remember in the beginning. But if a good deck builder is out there, he will stagger the different tones of the wood. However, you come out there, you clean it, you seal it, next thing you know you got a stretch where they're all dark, and then you've got light, and it's because the deck builder didn't, especially when they get to corners where they're smaller pieces, they don't stagger them. So the idea with ePay is you really want to sell everything in front and, and prepare the customer ahead of time, and then you'll be successful with it. Most people that don't like doing ePay is because they run into these problems after the fact. So. Same process, same cleaning, same everything else. Everything else is, everything else is the same. Like I said, on the other end of it, because the wood is dense, on on any hardwoods, is it won't penetrate as well. So you're letting them know that it's more like a yearly maintenance. If I, I don't know how most of you guys are doing wood. 
I'll get in. I, I jump ahead, so I'll, as things come up, so I'll jump ahead. But for me, I'm selling the next job when I leave yeah. the, this job. I give the estimate. I have the estimate for the following work that's going to be done, the maintenance, and when it should be done. So on an e-pay job, I would sell it as a yearly that's maintenance. Okay. Exactly, and then they, it's a discounted maintenance price. If they yeah. go past that, they go back to the original price. Real quick. <clears throat> So you're saying with your with your estimate, like I do the whole, I'll leave, I, I kind of give it at the bottom of my estimate, the uh, what it's going to cost for the maintenance. So you're saying leave a separate? No, I leave it with that. I okay. leave that. I leave okay. that maintenance, and what it'll be, whether it's a year, two years, three years, and it depends on what coding I'm putting on and so forth. Okay. So and then I also let people know too, ahead of time what that maintenance is going to be involved. If they're on the sunny side of the house, it may be less. I always, I don't give anybody. When you guys are giving estimates, so hopefully you guys don't put um, an exact time, because you'll put like, hey, it's going to be two years, and then they call you back in 20 months and say, hey, it didn't hold up. You know? So you usually should put a range, two years plus or minus, two to three years, whatever you're, but always give yourself a window. But uh, within that window, I give them that price. And then, uh, but our big thing is we're giving them a discounted price. One, we're keeping the competitors out. Two, they won't shop us if they like us anyway. And then we upsell all the time anyway. So when we go out, we're still bumping up that maintenance price anyway. So whether it's changing boards, routing, adding uh, post caps, all that kind of stuff. We just we make more in the add-ons than we do with the maintenance. Okay. And then anything I talk about too after we get done with this, because it's a lot to kind of squeeze in an hour. I'll be here for the next two days. Everyone's pull me aside. Please do. Okay. So anybody doing any redwood? Any new guys have ever done Redwood or how many people are kind of new, less than two years? Okay. You'll know a Redwood deck when you see it because you'll put stripper or something on it. It's going to turn black as night and you're going to be like, oh my God, I screwed it up. Best thing to do is make sure the homeowner's not there when you're there. But believe me, when you put the brightener on, it'll neutralize the tannins in the wood and it'll come back to nice, beautiful wood. But there's not a lot of Redwood out there. But it's funny because the new guys always do that, or if I ever do a class or something like this, I always give people my card, my phone number, and the call. I always get that frantic call. It's like, yo, I'm on this deck and it's black, and, and the homeowner thinks I screwed up. I think I did too. That's usually what it is. It's a redwood deck. All right. Um, most of the hardwoods are mahogany and e-paper, but like I said, there's a lot of other ones that are coming out, um, and a lot of that wood is. Um, People put a lot of money into it. I wouldn't like to, to address what you had said earlier. Don't be afraid because somebody spent, you know, thirty thousand on a deck that it's going to change what you're going to do with the wood. You're still either going to clean it, you're going to strip it, you're going to seal it. You're still going to be doing the same things. Okay, the weathering process. Um, most people know it's the, um, the 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 sun and the weather, or what's graying our wood giving us a reason to come back and so forth. Um, pretty basic stuff for a lot of people that have been around. Um, the newer people, what you're doing um, with the weathering process when you're explaining to a customer is that you, this is where you're telling them that, hey, because of the weather, because of all these um, uh, items that are going on, uh, that's the reason you're coming back in your maintenance plan. So why you're coming back in a year or in two years. Hey, good morning. <laughs> Okay, um, equipment, um, and good reason for Russ to be here. Anybody who needs, uh, is just doing, how many people are using hot water pressure washers and doing wood restoration? Two people, okay. And then cold water pressure washers? Okay, obviously with wood you're only using cold water, hot water raises the grain, um, you're not using a burner or whatever. Um, so you guys with your machines and where you're spec'd out at, you're probably good for running surface cleaners. A lot of people that are getting new into the business, they buy a cold water machine and they use something that doesn't have enough gallons per minute to carry a surface cleaner. If you're doing wood restoration, one of the things you really want to be able to do is use a surface cleaner. That's one of your best add-ons and it, uh, it just kind of adds a nice touch to it. Um, you go out there and you redo somebody's deck, make it look beautiful. The pool concrete looks terrible, the walkway looks terrible, the walkway around to the house to the deck looks terrible. Real easy add-on is a surface cleaner. Um, while I'm thinking about that, anybody uh, work with uh, decks with mulch and everything, right? 
You have mulch around the decks. How many of you guys carry rakes in your vans? Rake? Rake it up. You get done, everybody, they trample through the, through the mulch and through the, the, the gardening and so forth, the landscape, and they get down the deck, it looks beautiful, and then they don't think about just that nice touch. So when the homeowner looks at it, now they say, wow, everything looks great. It's just a nice touch. And when they see that the footprints are all through, a rag left, something, you know, whatever, the landscape doesn't look that great, guess what the next thing they do now is? They start looking at the work you did a little closer, too, and they find all the different little faults that they can come up with. So it just puts a nice touch on it and so forth. So, nice tip. Okay, um, moisture meters. For you guys using water-based, don't need them. Oil-based, you guys carry moisture meters? Does everybody know what a moisture meter is? If not, I have one in the back. Um, you stop and take a look at it. I would just recommend that you always use a moisture meter. If you're using a moisture meter, don't take it from one stop on the deck, one spot on the deck. Make sure you take it five, six different places, especially in the spring and the fall, because it can be a big difference. Uh, when it gets real hot, the sprinklers are going too. Uh, you can come out and the deck looks completely dry, and then you find out bubble in the house, it's wet. <clears throat> Make sure you carry your moisture meters. Um, we talked about e-pay and some of the hardwoods. When, you, when you're trying to get 15% or less moisture uh, for a lot of your woods, that's going to be different um, with the hardwoods. E-pay, it's hard to get below 20% a lot of times. So uh, that would be different. Um, but that's not something the customer needs to know. That's just something for you to need to know. You won't have the same readings that you do on soft woods. They do make moisture meters, though, very expensive, uh, that will, you can actually address soft woods and hard woods and so forth. Um, but carry a moisture meter. Um, everybody take pictures of all their work. What are the two reasons we take pictures? CYA. There you go. You got them both. <coughs> Cover your butts and marketing. Okay. The only the biggest challenge with pictures though is terrible is usually when you go out to a job and you're taking it in the morning and you're finishing later in the day. So the shadows make a big difference in your before and after pictures if you use them for marketing. Okay, some of the supplies. Um, I still keep talking about this one a lot because a lot of the a lot of the old school guys still use them, but people talk about raising and lowering their pressures. Anybody use a dual antoine with wood? There you go. It's a great tool. It's easy. You can just adjust the pressure while you're doing it. You don't have to change the tips and so forth like you do when we're, especially when you're using a higher gallon per minute machine or changing white tips. A dual lance wand is kind of an old school thing, but it still works and it's just a matter of getting used to it. Um, safety gear. Everybody use generators? Their equipment, sanders and everything? Does anybody not use generators and use the electric on people's homes? Sometimes it is available. Got it. It's just a smart idea to have a generator if you're right. doing this because you're going to throw somebody's electric off. It'd be a really sad thing if they were on vacation and they came home and all their meat and everything in the refrigerator went bad and then they were pissed off at you because the breaker went off and they couldn't get a, you couldn't get a hold of anybody. Right. It's funny how specific I can make that story sound. <laughs> anyway, um, I only had to learn that lesson one time. So, Gary, you have a generator. It's a nice touch. It looks professional. You're not using their electric. You don't have to worry about having a breaker. You don't have any of those issues. And it's funny because I look on Facebook all the time and these and, and the bulletin boards and so forth. And there's always comments about they threw electric. Somebody blames somebody about the electric not working something. So it's kind of a, it just takes that out of the equation. Okay, we start the, the process. I don't know if anybody does a splash test. For the guys that are new, this is definitely something you definitely want to uh, have a, a, a do test patches and, and have a kit so you know when you're coming out to do the job. One of the things that's a pet peeve of mine, and I look at the stuff and I'll never comment, is when somebody puts or asks for help and they say, hey, I got this job and I already bid it and I got the job, now how do I do it? Because Really, if you don't know how to do it and what's involved in it, how did you bid the job anyway? So if you got the job, you only got it because you were the lowest price. So now you're going to have all kinds of headaches anyway. One of the ways to alleviate a lot of the headaches is to have a test, uh, kit, test kit and do test patches. Um, first thing would be is what are we going to do when we go to the wood? Are we going to clean it or are we going to strip it? Now this will address something that comes up with mill glaze as well. I get into that. Um, people talk and debate whether there's such a thing as mill glaze or not. Mill glaze is where you have new wood and nothing's penetrating the wood 
and they say that it's because of dull blades at the sawmill or any of the other uh, stories that are out there. The bottom line is, it doesn't matter whether it's mill glaze or a stain or any sealer, anything that's on the wood, if you do a splash test, if the water beads up, you need to put a stripper on it and brighten it. If it water soaks in, you only need to clean it. So that's really what you're, what you're looking at. Um, now it's important to know that, especially for some of the people that have been in it for a couple of years or less, is to do the splash test, even if you see gray wood. Any of the veterans know why? God, Rick's laughing. Thompson's is the big one. But there's a, there, are, there are sealers and stains out there that will gray before a couple of years are up. You'll think there's nothing much to it. And then you go out and you think, hey, it's just a quick cleaning job. You go to throw the water on, it's beating up all over the place. You have to have a stripper. If you don't have a stripper on your vehicle, then that messes up your whole day as well. So always do a splash test until you get familiar. One of the things I always ask when I, I when I we do, um, there's a couple of things we do to get as much information as possible. When we take the initial call for an estimate, we have a bunch of questions that are asked. So we're finding out if they know the product, what was used last, that kind of thing. If they don't, they say, hey, we have a can, we just ask them to put it on the deck if they're not going to be there for the estimate. If they're there, we always ask what was the last product used. So we're trying to get as much information as possible. So if they say Thompson's, you kind of know that. But if you don't, do the splash test. Then you do a test patch. And what you're trying to do here is if you have a couple things on your, uh, in your test patch and your test kit would be a stripper, your alcohol wipes, um, to find out what, whether you're dealing with a water base or an oil base. Now, there's a couple ways to do that. Sodium hydroxide or a regular stripper that most people use, if you just put a little bit on, you're going to know whether or not that's going to come up as you're doing the estimate. Um, so you'll know that it's an oil base. If you're not sure, you can use an alcohol wipe. If you wipe that on a water base, you'll get a little stain that'll come off on the alcohol wipe. Now, one thing is if you use the alcohol wipe and a little, nothing comes off, then you know it's an oil base. So you do it that way as well. Some people use a test kit also to sell. Um, and what they do is they'll do a test patch somewhere so that the, the homeowner can know what the wood's going to look like when they're done. So you would want to put a brightener in your test patch too, because if you put a stripper on, just put a little brightener, and it'll wow them. And actually, after you leave from doing the estimate, they'll look at it you know, an hour, two hours, three hours later and just see that spot, and they'll be like, wow and they'll get that person to do it. Now, I know people that have done it to the middle of the deck. I don't recommend that. <laughs> You're kind of forcing the people, hey, okay, i got to get it done now. Um, but do it on the side or an inconspicuous area. That will also help you with so much by having a test, uh, test kit. It takes out a lot of your guesswork. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to, to give a much more informative estimate as well. Um, it's hard to see this flow chart. Um, I have it in manuals that I have. Um, but basically, if you don't have this, you should kind of make something, if you're, especially if you're new, just an idea. But you're doing your splash test. You find out whether or not it has a stain or not, whether or not you're going to be cleaning or stripping, and then you flow through from oil, wood base, and so forth. <coughs> but that's kind of the idea of it. I also have this PowerPoint, so anybody who wants to get this, all they have to do is just give me your email address and I can also send this to you as well after this. Um, but this is a, a great thing to have. Okay, the splash test tells us whether we're uh, stripping or cleaning. Um, I work on a 90-10 rule. I'm not trying to get 100% off. I actually sell that when I'm talking to the customer. The people that do 100%, they're putting too much pressure. They're taking, doing everything they can to get 100% off. I, I'm going 90%. What I'm trying to do is to pick places like where the mat was and that kind of stuff. I'm not going to ruin your wood. I'm going to come back. I'm going to lightly sand that stuff up for you. So I'm selling a 90-10 rule. Also, I'm also setting the expectation that if I can't get it all off and there is a little residual, I've, I've set that expectation. When you say 100%, they're expecting 100%. Okay. Um, What should we use? New wood maintenance cleaning. Uh, the cleaners you're going to run into mostly are percarbonate uh, bleaches or sodium hypochlorite bleach. Um, not a debate on which one. You know, don't use chlorine. <coughs> it's all right now. They're just mostly the cleaners. 
um, stripping, get into uh, either solvent base or caustic strippers, and then brightening could be uh, acids or blend of acids. The most common, uh, most people are using oxalic acid, I would assume. Okay. Um, alkalines and acids. Uh, anybody need to go into the pH scale? No. Um, shelf life of products. Percarbonates are going to last six to eight hours if you're using percarbonates to clean with. Don't store them under pressure. Don't keep them in your vehicles. Mix them on a job. Get rid of them at the job. They're more environmentally friendly. Sodium hypochlorite begins to weaken in days. Um, what I like, I have a rule of thumb. I, whatever we're going to use within a month, I don't, I'm not carrying any sodium hypochlorite more than that. Um, Caustic strippers and definite brighteners, 30 days after mix. A lot of people use powder uh, and then mix as well, so we're using concentrates. So that takes that out, it's after it's mixed. Um, now going back to bleach and percarbonates. Um, sodium percarbonate, oxygenated bleaches, great in our own waterways, great for environmental stuff, gardens, anybody who's worried about that kind of stuff. Regarding chlorine-based cleaners and so forth, the Forest Products Lab still to this day has a formula using chlorine bleach. Um, uh, with soap. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the other slides. But it's more <coughs> using chlorine, uh, chlorine, chlorinated bleach responsibly and not irresponsibly, with some of the high concentrations we see. Um, I'm sure the people who've been around here you can talk in the room or look around, we've all seen jobs where too much bleach has been put on wood. Um, you can do a couple things by using too much chemicals. One, you can give it a discoloration, but two, you can also burn wood, and that's with strippers, bleach, and so forth. High concentrations, left on wood, and so forth. So there's a misuse of it. So um, just by a show of hands, is there anybody in here who does not use chlorine bleach and markets that way to the customers? Nobody? Usually I get somebody I, I that does I don't use bleach that. on wood. What's uh, that? I said I don't use bleach on wood. I use percarb. Okay. And why don't you use chlorine bleach? I just don't like, how, I don't like the results from it. Okay. Um, I, would, I just want to bring this yeah. up to a couple things. Uh, my comments about chlorine bleach. Again, it's, it's the most misused chemical because it's used more than any other chemical. If it's used responsibly, it can be effective. Um, if I told you right now, sodium hydroxide is a stripper that we use often in wood restoration. If, if I told you to swallow sodium hydroxide, you wouldn't do it, right? But you're going to go brush your teeth and you're probably going to use toothpaste, right? Mm -hmm. Sodium hydroxide is in a lot of toothpaste. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's really just how you use it and how and being responsible. The idea is, will chlorine hurt wood? Chlorine can because chlorine is used in the process of making, making paper. What it does, it destroys the lignin. If you take the lignin, it leaves out the pulp, and they use that in the process of making paper. That's where it comes out that chlorine is bad for wood. So it's again, it's just a matter of whether or not you. you it's a tool in your toolbox, mm -hmm. and it's more being responsible. Now, for me, I use percarbonate bleach where I can, and sometimes there's applications where it just it doesn't work. I mentioned cedar shakes. Um, anybody who's cedar shakes or doing cedar shake roofs, if you have real heavy, heavy mold and mildew and it's getting into the shake, I can tell you, if you use percarbonate bleach, it's, it's, it's a big difference in using that and using chlorine bleach because it actually gets down a little bit and it really, it really uh, works better on the <coughs> mildew. So, anyway, um, any other comments, chlorine <coughs> bleach? Percarbonate uh, works better on the cedar. Is that what you said? It, it depends on the situation. Okay. And for me, a lot of people, when they're calling you for cedar shakes, they're pretty well down the road. It's a heavy mold, mildew, algae. Yeah. Bleach reacts with the first thing it hits, so percarbonate ble percarbonates don't, aren't as effective to me in, in, in the end result on the cedar shakes. Do you ever use a, a weak sodium hydroxide solution? Yeah, do or I also mix them as well. Yeah, as, as well. Um, if you use, and that's the other thing. I think that's on one of the slides actually. 
If you go up to a deck or cedar shakes or something that is really heavy mold mildew and algae, you could go to a stripper. It's going to do the same kind of same kind of thing. It's going to lift it up. A lot of times too, I've gone to jobs where they're heavy mold and mildew, and the guys are using bleach. No matter what bleach, they end up having to to really get a nice job. They have to clean it twice because, like I said, it reacts with the first thing it gets to, and it just doesn't look as good. If you go to the sodium hydroxide or go to a light a diluted down stripper, basically, and do it, you get a much nicer result. And it's it's a one-time cleaning, so yes, good point. Okay, um, whether we're cleaning or staining in the process, um, we're either, uh, we're always gonna work from the outside, uh, we do the lattice, we always work from the bottom, do the lattice, the skirting, anything like that, to the outside of the railings, inside the railings and the floor, and then we'll come off. We do the same thing when we're cleaning or whether we're stripping. Um, so anybody, I gotta change this. Anybody know that the kills mold and mildew? You can't use that term anymore. Did you know that? You know, with chlorine and bleach, it's not doesn't they say you can't use it on any of the uh, the cleaners and that kind of stuff about killing mold and mildew, but um, these are all the things we just talked about. Has anybody been on the Forest Products Lab site? Going back to that slide. If you go on there, there is a lot, there's a wealth of information. Um, it's, it's a government site. There are a lot of the recommendations, standards that have been done for wood restoration, whether it be, uh, could be anything from cleaning to staining to sealing to other things, um, you'll find on that site. There's a lot of, lot of good information on there. Okay. Um, <coughs> for carbonate, easy for maintenance, cleans, and so forth. Good for environmental cleaning. Strippers are strong alkalines. Um, very effective at removing oil bases. Um, who's using solvent? That's where I want to get into the to right now is the uh, solvent-based strippers. Or is everybody using one type of stripper, or are people using solvent-based strippers? Just yell out. I just use one type of stripper. One type of stripper. So everybody's doing mostly one type of stripper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, sodium hydroxide strippers are your main stripper that most people are using. Okay. The way the products are now, most of them, a lot of them are water-based, and a lot of them are durable, and they're adding things to them, uh, like urethane content and so forth, that make it a little bit harder that sodium hydroxide doesn't address. So if you're not using solvent-based strippers, I would say start getting some samples, start using them, start trying to. It'll make your job and your life a lot easier. It used to be, I had this talk a few years ago uh, down here, we were talking about solvent-based strippers. And they're a pain to use because they're, most of them are paste, gels, they're difficult to use. They actually make them now where they're sprayable, okay, through an airless sprayer. It makes, it makes the job a lot easier. Um, they really work well, uh, some of the solvents, on things like, I'm going to bring it up, Deck Restore, all those hard, <laughs> you hear the laughs. Um, anybody, what do you guys do with Deck Restore products or any of those kind of things? Whether it's Rust-Oleum, Bayer, who's ever product. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? Yeah. Everybody? It's the very durable stuff. Um, basically, it makes it look like it's a composite look and feel. <laughs> What's that? It's not durable. Well, it, it falls apart. Where it won't come off, it yeah. is, that's for yeah. sure. But yeah, it comes off in sheets. Yeah. But it's very difficult to both sand and to. But what happens is the solvent based strippers, there are strippers out there that will melt this stuff off really well and make it a lot easier. A lot of people are just walking away from it. Now, one of the things you have to do, and. Uh, with these products is you go out to an estimate, some people are just walking away from them, some people are addressing it, some people, you know, wherever they fall into it. Here's what you have to do with the Deck Restore products. One of the, th one of the uh, recommendations from the manufacturers are they'll fill quarter inch cracks. Most people are getting to the deck where it's on the other end, it's done. And they're trying to extend it a little bit. So what they do is they're putting the product on. Obviously, with wood that's 20 years old or older, there's going to be more than quarter inch cracks. So that's how they get away from even honoring a guarantee on it most of the time. The 
problem is, like you just mentioned, on those on those type of well any application on those specifically, it'll come off in sheets, but other areas it's not coming off. So what do you do with a deck that's 20 years old? Well, basically it's a kiss of death at that point. You got to put new wood down. Um, I see guys trying to flip boards and do all kind of the 20 year old deck. Forget it. Now, what you have to do when you get out to these jobs is what are you going to do? And there's only two choices. It's either re 